Hello and welcome from Summary Santiago, Chile, to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I have conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those with some connection to Latin America. This episode is brought to you by LatemList.com. If you like this podcast, you'll enjoy LatemList daily tech news reporting. Also, check out my book, Crossing Borders, A Venture Capitalist Guide to Doing Business in Latin America. You can find it on Amazon. My guest today is Maricel Science, a Costa Rican biotech entrepreneur who is the co-founder of Next Biotics, a company that's trying to find a solution for antibiotic resistance using engineered viruses to make them more efficient at killing bad bacteria. After growing up in Costa Rica and studying and working in Canada, South Africa, Maricel studied at Singularity University, where she met her co-founder, Jorge, a Peruvian entrepreneur and biotech PhD, decided to start Next Biotics. We cover Maricel's time at traditional companies, how she decided to go into entrepreneurship after getting a finance degree, why she decided to take on a really, really hard problem rather than going after an easier one, and what it's like being a biotech founder in Silicon Valley. We also talk about raising money for a biotech company, what it's like being a female founder as well as a Latin American founder in biotech in the United States. Maricel has great advice to entrepreneurs who are working on any business and has a unique perspective working on her startup in Silicon Valley as well as Latin America. I hope you enjoy this episode with Maricel Science. Hey, Maricel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Hi, Nathan. Thanks for having me. No, of course. So let's jump into it. Where are you in the world today? Uh, I'm in our office in Oakland, California. Awesome. And what are you working on? Um, so I'm working on our company, which is called Next Biotics. Um, and what we do is we work with this virus S called bacteriophages. Um, and these viruses are the natural enemy of bacteria. But we're engineering them and modifying them to make them more efficient. And our goal is to be able to kill antibiotic-resistant bacteria so that we can um, provide antibiotic alternatives to the huge crisis, which is antibiotic resistance. Tell me more about that crisis. What's going on? Yeah, so um, antibiotics have been like this amazing tool that we've used and we've kind of taken it for granted in the in the last few years. Um, we abuse them, sometimes take them when we don't need them, uh, but they're also abused in places like agriculture. So like more than 80% of the antibiotics in the market are used in agriculture. So what happens is we keep exposing bacteria to these antibiotics um, and they're starting to become resistant. So we're seeing more and more cases where none of the antibiotics in the market are able to kill bacteria. We've seen really, really drastic um, cases. For example, um, a woman in Nevada had an antibiotic resistant bacteria or, or what we now call superbug that was resistant to like all the types of antibiotics we have in the US. Um, and we're seeing more of these cases um, constantly. Uh, so we, there's like really scary statistics. For example, the WHO estimates that by 2050, more than 10 million people will die from antibiotic resistance. And, and the reason this is super scary um, is because one, um, if we don't have an option, it's definitely going to change our lives. Um, and two, people don't really uh, see it coming. It's like this horrible um, crisis is coming and we don't see it coming. And um, for example, I'll give you a, a perspective. It's like we would go back to the 1900s where if you get a cut and it gets infected, you might lose your arm, right? Or like where we were losing one in 100 women in uh, birth because of infections. Um, so I, I think it's super, super scary. And um, there's a piece there of, of also having a lot more awareness of, of what's coming. Yeah. And it's one of those problems that even if, say, the developed world decides that they fix it, um, it's a worldwide problem, just like global warming, right? Absolutely. Um, we know that in developing countries, there's less control of the distribution of antibiotics. Um, more developed countries have regulations around it where you need a prescription while I know of developing countries where you can literally get them in the corner store for like 25 cents and the uh, corner store owner is the one who give, who's giving you the prescription and antibiotics um, and, and that's that's honestly not only scary but worrisome in terms of the solutions that we're creating also need to be able to um, help all, all the way across from developed to developing countries. Yeah, it's a huge problem. And 
How did you decide to start working on this problem rather than any other business or uh, science that you could have gone into? Yeah. So um, I'll tell you the story of how we got started. I, um, last year, no, 2018, sorry. So in 2017, <laughs> um, I attended this program called Singularity University, which is this amazing program where you get to connect with a bunch of other people that want to use technology for um, to drive change, to, imp to possibly impact the world. Um, so I attended this program with the intention of creating a company that would address one of, or the major um, challenge that I could see we could create a solution for. And there I met who is now my co-founder. Um, his name is Jorge, he's Peruvian, and he at the time was a PhD candidate out of UC Berkeley. Um, Jorge had been very intrigued by the antibiotic resistance problem for a long time, and he had this idea of using his skill set in genetic engineering for, um, sorry, to modify the viruses so that we can create an alternative. And to me, what was extremely interesting was the scale of impact that we could have. So um, I like you, you can. Uh, Sam Altman has a really good quote where he says. It's easier to start a hard startup than a simple startup. Um, and I just think that if you take like a really, really big challenge, then it makes everything worthwhile because this ride is like super up and down. But um, for me, it was more like if we have the possibility to create a solution to such a big problem, we're literally going to be able to save lives um, and hopefully change the course of, of what we think is going to be a huge issue in the future. Yeah, it's great to see people working on businesses that and problems that aren't like, you know, a photo sharing app for dogs, uh, like we have a lot in uh, these days. So it's it's awesome that you're doing it. Uh, I want to jump back into you. Uh, where are you from originally? I'm from Costa Rica. Half Costa Rica, half Panamanian, actually. And where did you spend most of your time growing up? So I grew up in Costa Rica until I was um, 18, 19, and then I moved to Canada, where I went to university and worked um, the first couple of years. And what did you study in, uh, in university? Um, so I have a finance major, <laughs> which is very uh, different from what, from what we're doing now. Uh, but I spent a lot of my time in university uh, working and learning more about social enterprises, entrepreneurship. Um, actually, the first... Um, startup that I was involved in was in university. We had this program where they would put together three business students and three engineers to come up with an idea. Um, and we started working on the medical device space, trying to make an impact and help the autism community. And uh, the company is actually still going. So um, one of the engineers took it right after school. Um, I kept going and that was kind of my first um, exposure to entrepreneurship. And that's where I realized that that's what I wanted to do. But I also understood that I had to learn a lot more so that I could be a successful entrepreneur. So I went um, to the corporate world and I joined uh, Monitor Deloitte in their strategy consulting practice. And my whole goal there was to learn from people who have been doing this for a really long time. Um, how do you build businesses? How do you solve problems? How do you, can you apply different frameworks and methodologies to issues so that you can come up with a solution on the other side? Um, so I did that for a couple of years. And were you entrepreneurial growing up in Costa Rica, or was that something that hit you when you were at university? Uh, I would say it hit me when I was at university. Um, I was a lot more um, like in student politics and volunteering when I was in high school. And when you were at university, what was what was that spark or what was that inflection point where you thought that it was, you know, I want to actually go into the business side and I want to start, try to start something or solve problems rather than, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people could go in and decide, you know, I'm going to work at a, a big company and that's going to be my life. Yeah. So, um, when I, after my second year of university, I went and spent three months in South Africa, um, in this program where we were helping entrepreneurs jumpstart their businesses. So basically it was a mine who was dying and, and we're seeing that all around the world. Um, and they could see that it only had a few years left. So instead of just letting the town become a ghost town. They were trying to reinvest in the community and make them entrepreneurs. So we came um, with my business school, there were five of us who lived there for three months, working side by side with the entrepreneurs. Um, and I could really see the impact of people uh, building their own businesses, creating their own value, having independence, not having to, um, let's say, de depend on a big company to be able to um, feed their family, but also they were the ones who were really solving the community problems because they understood them from the ground. 
Um, and also at that time, I read this book, which um, is still the day one of my favorite books. It's called The Blue Sweater by Jacqueline Novogratz, who's the founder of Acumen Fund. Um, and her whole perspective is that it's social enterprises that are really going to change the world. She's not in favor of like charities, for example, or just giving money away. But it's like if someone has a good idea that it's going to be beneficial and we give them money and create a business around it, then it's like um, it's a win win situation, right? Where you're creating social good and at the same time creating a successful business, which means you can get more investment and you can get more jobs um, and, and make it successful. So it was at that point where I, I guess, discovered what a social enterprise was and, and at that time decided that that's what I wanted to do, that I wanted to learn how to be really good at doing um, all the business things so that I can then use it as a tool to drive social impact. Did you work any on any other social impact impact projects either after school or before this uh, this business that you're working on today? Uh, so then we worked in during university. We had like an organization where we organized different events and brought the community together around social enterprises in, in Vancouver, where where I went to school. Um, and then when I was working for Deloitte, they also have um, these opportunities to do pro bono consulting with certain non for profits or NGOs. Um, so I was heavily involved with one of them um, leading our project in my first year at Deloitte. Awesome. And how did you decide to go to Singularity University and what was it like during the program? Yeah. So um, remember when I was telling you that when I was in Canada, we started this company. It's actually called Reveal and um, the, it, it's created solutions for autistic families. So we applied to a bunch of different competitions and... Andrea, who's now um, the, the CEO, she got accepted to go to Singularity and I couldn't apply because I wasn't Canadian. Um, but that day I learned how awesome it was. She went, she loved it. And I decided one day I was going to go to it too. So it's January 2017, I'm plugging away at work and I see that Costa Rica has opened their own global impact challenge to send one representative to go to Singularity. And at that point, I started um, working every night and weekend on creating what could be a proposal and it, it's basically a challenge. So they want to understand whether you have the, the, the capacity and the motivation to think really big. Um, so the question is, um, how would you impact a billion lives? So I created a proposal or an idea of what I thought could be um, a potential way to help a billion people. Um, and then I was elected to attend Singularity at that time, that was April, 2017. And the program in itself was um, amazing. It was like the first time that I felt I met like what people describe as their tribe. Um, it was all these people from very different backgrounds, some very technical, some technical in terms of like themes. So for example, people that knew a lot about like water conservation or climate change. Um, a lot of people that were really deep into like AI or Jorge who was like really deep into um, genetic engineering. And you bring all these people together and then they, expose you to a bunch of different speakers and content. Um, and then you have all these like brilliant individuals who are staying up at like one in the morning every night, li literally trying to solve things like, how are we going to ensure people when um, the, the water rises a lot and then it, it takes away entire communities in places like Bangladesh, how are we going to ensure them and be able to provide them solutions? And um, I think there's few places in the world where you lock people up for three months and get them to think about like the really, really important places and they have, uh, sorry, problems um, and they have really a good time doing it. So <laughs> um, I love the program and I would say that my main takeaway and the one that I hope uh, and try to share with people a lot is that sometimes you underestimate what you're capable of. And I think sometimes we are the biggest enemies of our own potential. Like we start putting ourselves in boxes, right? Of like, oh no, so like I went to business school and um, this is my skill set, and therefore I will always work in this area. Or I am a scientist um, and I'm going to do a PhD and then I'm going to become a postdoc. Um, and it's, it's really important to sit down and be like, I can learn whatever I want, right? Like everyone at this time, like information, education is so available. Um, anyone can learn anything that they really want to put like their heart and soul into it. But it's just a change of mindset of like not putting ourselves into a box. Um, so that to me was like the biggest moment of being like, wow, I can I can do whatever I want. <laughs> what advice would you give to somebody that maybe is thinking too much in their own lane uh, and wants to try to do something else, but maybe is a little bit intimidated from doing it? Yeah, 
So I think the, the most important thing there, and sometimes the hardest one, is to take a step back. Um, and we get so caught up in our daily lives that it's really hard to just take a step back and, uh, and map it. Um, but I think is like the, the worst, um, there's this phrase in Spanish, which is like the worst attempt is the one that you never do. Um, so if someone is really, really passionate about something, it's, it only takes like, I would say a couple searches to understand whether there's an opportunity there. It's really easy to see how they could learn a little bit more from that. And something that um, I think my best, my main recommendation would be like, just reach out to people. Like you can literally find um, anyone on LinkedIn and ask them for a coffee, for a call, and they will take it. Most people will. Um, so if you're really caught up in your own lane, how you say it, um, and you're trying to look for a change, my main recommendation is look for someone who's doing something that you think it's amazing that um, you really look up to and ask them out for a coffee and ask them how they got there, uh, if they have any advice, maybe they even have like a little side project that you can start helping with. Um, and most, most people have been there before and would be really willing to, to take the time. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And also too, I think if you send that initial email or, or LinkedIn message with either a comment on what they're doing and a, a very, some very specific questions or a very specific question, it's, you're really more likely to get an answer. Uh, I think that's something that I think especially people from Latin America don't do well, uh, and a lot of the best entrepreneurs do do well, is being willing to get over the sort of shame of maybe being told no or reaching out cold. So I think that's, that's it's a really important piece of advice. Absolutely. And, and I think that second piece is super important too. Like a lot of people are going to say no, but there's so many more, right? So let's say you want to learn um, about like um, AI and how it's being used to, I don't know, optimize government decisions. And um, I don't know, there's 10 people that are doing it. If you send a message saying like, hey, this is my experience. This is when I want to learn more about it. Um, do you have time for a coffee? Oracle, 15 minutes. That's my trick. If you always ask for 15 minutes, and then if it's interesting, they'll give you more. <laughs> so going back to the application stage to get into Singularity, you had to think about something to help a billion people. And I think that's something that probably most people have never thought about or don't think about very often at all. So how did you go about thinking about the idea to come up with? And uh, how did you go about fleshing it out so that you could apply? Yeah, so uh, the main thing that a lot of people will say when you're starting business is like focus on the problem. Um, you don't really want to be a technological solution looking for a problem, right? You want to understand to the deepest level what the problem is and then try to create a tailored solution for that. So when I was like back in, in January, when I, when I saw this challenge and I wanted to apply to SU, what I did is like I listed all of the major problems that I cared or, or, or thought were important. Um, for example, my the one I, I, I was keen and, and still I'm trying to find a solution for is protecting the ocean. So the ocean is um, a major source of life for us. And we are literally just um, trashing it away. It's full of plastic. It's full of microplastic. It's getting warmer because of global warming. And because it's so huge and it doesn't really belong to any of us, there's no, no, there's no stakeholder taking care of it. So I wrote down what some of the major problems with, with the ocean were. Um, and then I took a list of all the technologies, the exponential technologies that I thought could have an impact on it and then try to make a match. Um, so it was this, this strange process of, of first identifying the problem. And then once I had a good understanding of that, looking at what technologies could provide a solution. But um, the, bigger, the bigger the problem, the more likely it is that you can have a, a very different and a novel approach to solving it, specifically in areas where um, where there's not a lot of, of parties involved. Yeah, I think, I forget who talks about this, but uh, the guy, I think he wrote Moonshots, talking about how the solving a really, really difficult problem, people way overestimate how difficult it is, but the impact is is outsized and people way underestimate how difficult it is to start just a simple startup idea. So in his opinion, you may as well just focus on a big one. Yeah, exactly. Or um, there's also Peter Diamandis, which is the co-founder of Singularity. And he always talks about how um, the biggest problems are, in fact, the biggest opportunities. And if you see them in that way with your entrepreneurial mind, then um, a lot of, of potential comes out. So if you start of, instead of thinking, oh, um, 
there's places in Africa where there's lack of access to water. Um, and if you put a lot of bright minds together, th there could be a, a great solution, which could end up being a business. So you meet your co-founder at Singularity. What was the process from saying, oh, I, I like this person, I like what they're working on, to saying, you know what, I want to actually work on a, this problem together and spend the next five to 10 years of our life on this? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Co-founder relationship is the um, most novel relationship I've experienced because it's not um, a personal and it's not just a professional. It's like this hybrid between being colleagues and being really good friends. Um, and I hadn't, I hadn't experienced that before. So when I met Jorge, I thought he, and I still think he's brilliant. Um, and that he had a very, very different skill set than I have, which in time has proven to be like, it's, sometimes it's hard for us to communicate because we're so different, but at the same time, um, we complement each other really well. So we spent these two, three months together. And then towards the end of the program, we started spending a lot of more time just um, as a team, we had a, a few other people that were helping out at the, at the time, kind of fleshing out what this could be, how we would work on it, what the idea would really um, like materialize into. We actually did a couple of pitches, talked to a bunch of different um, advisors. And as we started to get feedback on that there was real potential into this, then um, we started having like the, the serious conversations up front of being like, okay, if we work on this, how would we work together? Um, what would be our goals? What would be our stop gates as well? I think that's important. And a lot of entrepreneurs don't, don't think about that. But for us, it's important to say, okay, we, we also need to time box this, right? Um, and say at, at that time, it was um, September and we, we were going to give it a year. And now, um, a year later, we've been able to raise money. We have a lab. We have a team. We have, um, I would say now, a real company, which at the time was an idea. And talking about communication, founder communication, and even just team communication is super important. And it's really can be hard between, say, a business side co-founder and an engineering co-founder, in your case, a sort of business side plus uh, PhD science, hard science yeah. background. What strategies have you used to make that work? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, Jorge and I are very different. Like, He's an introvert. I'm an extrovert. Um, he's a guy. I'm a girl. He's a scientist. I'm a business person. Like we're literally like what are normal. And and it took us some time to really understand how to communicate efficiently. And to be honest, it was a lot of trial and error. Like for example, we tried initially to do like maybe like 15 minute meetings at the beginning of every day to say what we're gonna do, and then at the end, and then we realized that that wasn't really a, a good use of our time. Or, and then we tried emails and then we tried uh, meetings. And now what we do is um, we have a meeting at the beginning of the week where we have previously set the agenda of what we're going to be talking about. And then we discuss it and we take notes on the decisions that we made. Um, and that's really helpful because a lot of the times it would be like, maybe we talk about it, but it didn't really feel like the decision was made. We were just talking about it, but just writing it down and saying like, no, this is what we're agreeing on. Um, has really helped us, um, I would say, like speed up the way that we make decisions. Um, and we've been having that method for, for the last few months, and it's, it's working really well. So we do that at the beginning of the week, say this is what we're going to work on, this is the decisions that we're going to make. And then at the end of the week, we go back to that exact document and make notes at the end of being like, these were some of the challenges that we faced this week. Um, this is kind of what I need to focus on next week. And we also do that with our team. So we also get together every Monday, everyone shares what they're going to work on. And then on Friday, they share uh, what their progress was uh, and also their challenges. I actually think that, that what was hard of the week and what you couldn't do, it's sometimes more important than what you could do because that's where my role and Jorge's role um, as co-founders and, and leaders of the team is to find out how do we remove blocks from, from our team so that they can um, get, their, get the job done. It's a good, really good strategy. And one of, one of the things that stuck out to me when, a few years ago when I was talking with I have a, an Uncle John whose whole job was basically trying to make scientists and business people connect. And he, he showed me a document once where basically it was what a scientist means and uh, and what the, the business person hears and then the opposite. And so I've actually used that with uh, what the engineer hears and what the business co-founder hears and what they actually mean to go back and forth when because most of the time it's just a communication block. People want the exact same thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know what's really interesting too? Like sometimes we would leave meetings and I would be like, oh my God, that was terrible. And you'd be like, no, that was great. <laughs> so we also have this thing where we like debrief meetings after, right? And that's super helpful. We'd be like, what did you hear? 
Um, and how did you interpret that? Because, yeah, sometimes we walk away <laughs> with very different perspectives on how it went. So as you start working together, what was the inflection point where you decided, you know what, this is, this is the real thing. Let's, let's go for this. Let's actually dedicate full time. Well, yeah. So we got accepted very, very soon after to use the Berkeley's Accelerator, which was our initial funding. So they gave us um, $100,000. And with that, we had enough money to have uh, or conduct a proof of concept experiment where we could see if, if the technology could actually work and if there was business potential for it. So that was December 2017. And at that point, we now had people that believed enough in what we wanted to do to give us funding. So I went back to Canada, quit my job, um, and then came back to, to do the accelerator full time where he was uh, finishing his PhD, but because we were at Berkeley, that, that worked really well. Um, and then we, right after that, we raised some funding, um, and then moved in, into our own space. So yeah, I would say it was having, um, that external validation. Cause sometimes you think you have a great idea. I think it's happened to all of us and you're like, this is great. And then people are like, uh, no, but having, because it was a very long application process. Like we had multiple interviews, multiple rounds of questions, multiple rounds of talking to advisors. And eventually they were like, yes, we believe um, you have potential here and we are going to invest in you. So at that point, we we won full on. What was it like raising money for a biotech? Most of the people on the podcast have you know, traditional sort of uh, commercial tech or B2B uh, type, type of businesses. And I think a lot of people have talked about raising money for those businesses, but not on the biotech side. So what's that been like? Yeah, biotech is it's different. We we raised our pre-seed round last year and we're about to go raise money again in a couple of months. Um, and I was one talking to, once talking to this founder who's biotech and he's raised a um, large amount of money. And I was telling him like, oh yeah, fundraising is right. Like it's more an art than a science. And he was like, no, it's very much a science. Um, and I think the more you approach it, like it, like systematically, the better it is, um, for biotech, it's interesting because there's been this huge boom in biotechnology in the last year, um, where a lot of people are, um, realizing the potential that it has to change multiple industries, right. All the way from creating synthetic materials to creating, um, cell, cell agriculture meat to, for us, like using genetic engineering to modify existing organisms. So it's brought a lot of interest from both investors that are, are very familiar with biotech and investors that are not. So we met with both um, and they were very different conversations. We, I have examples of working literally like taking out a marker in the whiteboard and explaining uh, some concepts of, of how it actually worked. But those, those investors have a great sense of how to create a really good business. So I think it's a really cool match of saying like, oh, how do we, we draw parallels between like the SaaS or um, all this other or hardware into into biotech. Um, the process in itself is it's tricky because when they come to do their due, due, their due diligence, uh, which means they're basically going to kind of like look under the cover of what your technology actually looks like. It's this tricky medium between you want them to give a, a lot of data, but also there's a lot of IP and a lot of things that you can share specifically that you, you don't know they're going to invest. So it's kind of this um, strange um, situation where you need to provide enough information to make them comfortable, but not too much where you're basically giving away your technology. Um, and the best way to do that is to kind of work with people that have raised money before. Um, we worked super closely with our first investor who was, who's the lead investor and, and managing partner of Skydeck. Um, and he would be really good at, at, at help us answer the questions in a way that would, um, give them confidence, but would but not too much <laughs> information there. Um, I would actually not know how it's different because biotech is the only industry that I've raised money for. Um, I do know that sometimes we struggle because we are a younger team. Um, a lot of biotechs have much older co-founders and much older teams. Um, so that's something that we've, we've struggled with a little bit of um, kind of being taken seriously. I, that Which is probably different from like, um, like the tech industry where a lot of the founders are actually very, very young. Oh, so the, the great thing about it, and maybe this is different, is you, we would go into the first meeting, which probably I would take first, and then we talk about what we want to do, how we want to structure it, what we're raising, and then they bring in their technical advisor. 
So they'll bring in either someone they know really well or someone they work with who really understands that technology. And then that person comes in and does their due diligence and then they report out to, to the investor. Well, I'm assuming that for tech companies, it's more like the investor knows enough to make the call. That's really interesting. And you talked about making sure to be taken seriously because of being young. Um, in addition to being young, you're a female co-founder in a science business in tech. And there's been lots of talk about um, basically the hurdles that uh, women have to get over to extra compared to men in, uh, in business like this. Have you experienced any of that? And what's your experience been like being a woman co-founder of a biotech company? Yeah. Um, so I get this question often. And the, the best answer I can tell you is like, I don't know how hard it is in comparison because this is the only thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, but it is, um, it's hard in the sense that sometimes you will get questions that I know male founders don't get. Um, all the way from like one time I had an investor asking me if me and my co-founder were dating and I said, absolutely not. And then he said that that's something that I should say in my pitch because people see that as a risk. And I'm like, I am a hundred percent sure you don't ask that to guys. <laughs> you're, not, you're not asking guys to say in their pitch what their like marital status is, right? Like that is super unfair. Um, and then they, they do. And I, when I, when I was able to see comparison between, for example, having one of my, friends go pitch to the same investor before um, and then I would go next you could definitely see how they treat you differently um, because of this amazing movement of like me too and women speaking up um, it, it has also kind of backlash to men being like then I can't really even be in a room with you you know what I mean like I need like three feet away and that makes it really hard when you're trying to create a connection with someone and create rapport and trying to work together if they're just like you know trying to stay super super far away um, and the other thing that, so, so I think women, uh, and, and we face a very different scenario when we go fundraising, we all know that only like 2% of venture capital funding goes to women and that hasn't changed. Like all the people are like, oh, there's so many women raising money. Like that was the same for 2018. Um, hopefully it's not the same for 2019, but another angle on it is that I'm not only a woman, but I'm Latin American. And so is Jorge. So we belong to to an even smaller minority. Um, and I actually think that sometimes that's been harder than being a woman. Um, that's been harder when, when talking to investors, like I've seen the tone of voice change when we um, maybe uh, talk about our backgrounds and how we're, we're not really from here. Um, and that's, that's one that's not talked about a lot and there's not a lot of, of support about that. Um, but yeah, like if you look at the numbers, it is 2% of um, funding goes to women, but only like 1% goes to uh, Black and Latin Americans. So it, it, I, for us, it's like, a, it's harder on both ways. But what we try to do is just like, lead with what we're working on, right? Um, lead the conversation and try to take it away from who we are and what we look like, and more into like what we're working on and how, how important it is. Um, and I think that having an attitude of being like, it doesn't matter who I am. It matters what I'm doing and why that's why you should care about it has helped us have those conversations in a more maybe objective way. Um, yeah. But I think the solution to this is to have more female founders. <laughs> um, I, I get asked a lot, like, what I think could change. A lot of people think that we could have more women VCs, but it, it's been understood that, that it's a cycle because a lot of VCs end up being successful entrepreneurs. So the more female founders that we have, we'll tend to hire more females in their first few hires when they're um, walking away with a little bit of stock, which allows them to invest, which makes more um, female investors, which hopefully kind of changes a little bit the conversation. Um, but I think women should be encouraged to be entrepreneurs and not be scared by the fact that it, it might be hard to raise money, but it's hard for everyone. And what advice would you give to a female founder or a Latin American female founder who's trying to either start a business and maybe not wanting to take the first step yet or out trying to raise money? What's worked for you and what advice would you give them? So the, the main thing that has worked for me is having an extremely supportive co-founder. So, you know, pick your co-founders really well. Um, and, and this is important because, for example, even if we've had meetings where people 
you know, the, the typical where they're like not looking at you or like not addressing questions at you, like pretending like you're not there. Jorge is the first one to like redirect. Um, like, for example, if it's a business question, he will be like, Maricel is going to answer that question or you should ask her. And having him kind of give me my space makes it immediately obvious that they needed to give it to me too. Um, so that to me has been a massive um, difference to maybe other female founders or solo founders. Um, my advice would be surround yourself by a really good group of um, advisors of a lot of people that have done it before and try to find women who have done it before. So I reach out to Latin American founders who I really admire um, and I've asked them out for coffee and be like, can I just talk to you? And I find that I resonate with their experiences and their advice a lot more than they do with people that don't look like me. Um, so I would say reach out to people that look like you understand your business, understand what you're going through to give you specific advice. But then it's just like, lead with your business, lead with what you're doing, why it's important, why you're doing it, um, and try to keep the conversation there. Um, and I also think that although it's really important that we talk about these this topics, um, they at times can kind of scare people. Um, but I would say that it's changing and it's getting better. And there's a lot more like networks and female found, uh, female focused VCs um, and organizations. So please don't get discouraged. <laughs> and again, as I was saying earlier, like the best thing that we can do is try. Um, and there's, it's such a good learning opportunity that there's honestly no, no downfall to it. Yeah. And going back to your Latin America, uh, point from before you're you're totally right i mean we see it with the entrepreneurs that we that we back and it, they're the good thing is is that it's changing some um i remember in 2014 with adrian fisher from property simple i think was episode two of the podcast we did a six-week cross-country tri trip and people would ask all sorts of crazy questions about latin america like is there internet in chile how are you going to find people to be programmers um we show them drone footage of Santiago and they'd say, Oh, I'm surprised there's tall buildings there. Um, and we had similar things with LATAM entrepreneurs that basically were told, you know, fire everybody in your home country and move them all to San Francisco and that, then we'll fund you. Um, and I just finished up a three week trip with one of our other portfolio companies to DC, New York and San Francisco. And we didn't get a single crazy LATAM uh, question. So I think it is starting to change, uh, but we always talk about how the the network of Latin American entrepreneurs, like you said, is extremely helpful. And not even just entrepreneurs, people who are have Latin background but work in big companies, almost everybody is willing to help. So your advice to reach out is is just spot on. Yeah, and for example, even um, at Skydeck, there always there's always been a Latin American uh, company, and and luckily enough. Um, I think in, in the last two batches, which has been the, the only two funded cohorts, um, the Latin American com companies have ended up being on like the, the top side in terms of like fundraising or potential. So I think that's amazing. And that's really encouraged them to keep looking down in Latin America for options, but it's also created a, like a really cool support system. Like, um, some of my closest friends, they have companies and they're from Colombia, Mexico, Peru, um, and, and, and it's definitely growing, but I think something that I think it's a little bit of homework for, for us as well is to start getting that community closer together, um, getting everyone to connect and also find a way to share what we're experiencing here and what we're learning here back down home so that people can learn from it um, and use it for their advantage. So where's the business today? What's uh, the status of the tech and what's next for, for the business? Yeah, so um, we've been really working on, on the development of, of the technology. We now have um, our modified viruses that can work really efficiently. So we can do things like make them more stable, um, significantly more stable to heat, which is important, which is one of the main limitations of our viruses. We've also created this huge phage library. So we have over 100 viruses that can attack some of the most pathogenic bacteria. Um, which means that if we ha are able to identify a pathogen, we can look up and match it with 100 of the ones that we have. And, and we're continue continuously growing it more. Our next step now, which is key, we're going to be raising our seed round. Um, and the objective of the seed round is to scale our pilots beyond like experimental farms to more like um, institutional partners um, and also grow our team a lot more. 
Um, so we're targeting that for Q2 of 2019. What are some of the advantages of being able to do some of your trials in LATAM? Yeah, so we think um, our strategy right now, what we want to do is we want to conduct our initial trials in Latin America, um, collect a lot of data, um, and then bring that to regulators in the U.S. There's a lot of um, advantages. Of course, one of them is cost, but cost goes really tied to very supportive ecosystems and great talent. So we've been talking to both Mexico and Costa Rica. There's really booming um, scientific communities that are interested in what we're doing and they're super supportive, right? So they can they want to give us lab space, they want to give us connections to farms, um, and they also have really good um, PhD master students that can work with us down in Latin America. Um, the second one is also just the the scale of it, right? Like we can do pilots in a lot of different countries which have different epidemiologies. Well, in the US, it's a lot more homogeneous. Um, so that gives us advantages, for example, if we can try it out in Mexico and Brazil as two examples, um, then that, that proves out our technology a lot better. That's super interesting. And switching gears to ask you a couple of questions at the end here. Uh, what, do you have any books, blogs, podcasts, documentaries, other than the book that you mentioned earlier that you either really like yourself or like to recommend to other people? Um, so more than books and podcasts, which I have a few, but the main thing are articles. So Medium, it's like this amazing source of information. Most problems that you faced, another entrepreneur has faced them before. And some of the great ones have written an amazing blog post everywhere from like how to conduct your seat round, like how to talk to investors, what's the best deck to create, to creating financial models, to if you have, if you want to create a landing page to test your um, like appetite for your product, how do you do that? So my first recommendation is always like, if you have a question, look it up. And there's probably been an amazing blog post. Um, and I think there's a few people that have started to accumulate those. Um, so that's amazing. In terms of books, I would say the hard thing about hard things is really good. I recently read Bat Blood. I don't know if you know, that's the one about Elizabeth Holmes and Tyrannus. Yeah, amazing book. Amazing book and just a great warning, right? It's just, um, I think, a great warning for everyone um, to just be really honest about what you're doing and also not get carried away, but like, you know, huge, huge, um, hunting rounds. Um, I like zero to one. I think that's like a great manual. And then podcasts. I like uh, masters of scale, which is Reed Hoffman's. Um, and then Sam Altman has a really good set of podcasts, which was like, he gave a class in Stanford of like the almost like entrepreneurship one-on-one from his learnings in YC. And it's all been recorded and it's out in a podcast. So those are great resources. Yeah, that's an amazing resource. We try to make all of our founders that we support watch that right after we invest if they haven't seen it because it's it's just really the best thing that's out there. Yeah, it's great. And he'll go into things from like product market fit to like really honestly being like hiring um, and give very tactical advice. Um, I, I really enjoy that one. And then Reid Hoffman's Master of Scale is awesome because he interviews people um, and the best thing you learn from it is for example, the Slack co-founder, they started at a completely different place, right? And he tells you about their journey um, and what things he was really listening to to make sure that he ended up with a successful business at the other side. If you could go back to right when you were starting Singularity University, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give yourself? Um, I would be more conscious about building a really strong support network. Um yeah, I think that that would be my main, my main advice to myself. It's entrepreneurship, unfortunately, is a very lonely journey because you you end up working with a small team and taking like a lot of the work to yourself. Um, and I think have, being sur surrounded yourself by either people that are doing similar things or have done it before will really help you um, kind of stay stay afloat. So I would say build a strong support work out of the, the get go. And um, the second one would be. I think we should have talked to customers much earlier. Like everyone needs to talk to whoever they think their customers are super early. Like that's the first thing you need to do because you learn so, so many things from them. Um, so now we systematically talk to customers every week, but I wish I had done that at the beginning and that I had established that it's kind of like a routine that I'm always constantly talking to people. Uh, now I'm doing that, but that would be my main advice to myself. I think that's really good advice, especially the first part about building that network. It's, it is a tough journey. And 
I'm excited to see how you and your co-founder continue on the journey and build the business. I really hope that you're successful. We all need more people working on the big problems in the world. So thanks for doing it and thanks for sharing your story. No, thank you for having me. Um, really glad to share a little bit about what we do and what we're up to. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with my guest, Maricel Science. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share it with a friend as it's the best way to raise awareness for Latin American startups and obviously this podcast. Thanks to Angel Sofia and Josefina for helping produce this podcast. And thanks for you for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day.